everybody. Uh, welcome to our workshop, uh, GA 101, Get the Job. Uh, I'm Julie with the Elite Graduate Program, and uh, we've been fortunate to have three departments from this university come and, and speak with you all about the one item, so you can see it from all different angles. Uh, we do have Terry Howe, who is the Assistant Director, Associate Director of the Career Services here on campus. We have Kristen Gardner, who, I'm sorry, don't know your... I'm Business Coordinator. Business Coordinator for the Graduate Studies Office. Uh, we also are supposed to have two speakers from Human Resources, Adriana Vela and Tony Neron. Neron. Uh, hopefully they'll show up here shortly to add to our presentation. Um, and then once everyone has spoke, if we will be open for questions afterwards. With that said, I'd like to hand this over to Terry Howe. Well, thank you. I um, appreciate the opportunity to get to come and talk to you guys. Uh, how many of you students have been to Career Services and are familiar with where we're located? Anybody? A couple of you? Wonderful. A couple of you? Okay, great. Um, we're actually located in the uh, third story of the third floor of this building, uh, Suite 304 University Center. And our services are open to all currently enrolled students and alumni. And so if you're currently enrolled, then what I'd like to point out to you is you've already paid for our services, so please come and use them if you have not already done so. I'm going to talk a little bit about what that means to use our services, and uh, we're just thrilled to get to work hand in hand with um, the ELITE program uh, to help you guys become successful and meet your end goals, which are for a lot of you uh, finding some sort of uh, professional experience at the end of the graduate road for you. So part a, a big resource for us and a, a big thing that we utilize a lot is our website is what we have behind me right here. And off to the, um, the left hand side, I'm, I'm not sure if you can see this real well, but it says jobs for Islanders and it has student login. And what we require is that you be registered with our services in order to use them. And the reason why we do that is because you students pay for our services and we want to be sure you're the ones that are getting to use it and not non-students. So we have this registra registration process that you go through. And it's simply you, you, go, you log into there, you do input some pretty basic information about yourself, and you are required to upload a resume. And uh, that's something I'll be talking to you a little bit about in, in a minute is your resume. All of that goes on there. And then through that database is how we communicate with students. We, we send you res, uh, emails and things like that. And it's also how you're able to access job postings that we have in our system. And so if you haven't already done so, um, like I said, you've already paid for it. So please use that service. It's open to you. Um, Let's see here. Let me see if I can get this thing to cooperate with me. One thing uh, that I talked about uh, just a little bit ago that's really important, it's part of your profile and it's also going to be part of you marketing yourself to employers is your resume. And uh, that's what I tell students a resume is. It's, it's a marketing tool. It's selling a great product to the employer and you're that great product. And so how you represent yourself on the resume is how the employer is going to see you and determine whether or not, hey, this person might be a good fit for us. So we're going to talk about resume. One thing I want to point out with you as graduate students is um, you're probably going to need to consider two things, a resume and possibly a curriculum vita. They're different documents. A resume is simply a in most cases, a one-page document is pretty succinct, and it uh, gives a simple snapshot, a picture, if you will, of your experiences and your qualifications and your skills. Uh, curriculum Vita goes into way more detail. <laughs> Does anybody have a Curriculum Vita already or working on it? You have one, a CV? Um, we have samples on our website under our student um, 
resources. So if you'd like uh, to try to get started on that, uh, we have a great sample on there to help you with that. I'm not going to go into the CV uh, today just because that would take a lot of time, but just know if you'd like to work on that, uh, you can get started working on it and then you can come to our office and we'll help you um, uh, hone it, get it ready uh, to use to help you with your job searching. Curriculum Vitas are really good for when um, you're looking for teaching positions. Um, when you've published things already or you've done some pretty substantive research in your field, if you've, if you've already had teaching experiences, had some research opportunities, had some publications or been able to present somewhere, um, then you might already have a good start to a curriculum vita and, and so you'll want to go on there, look at that sample and um, maybe start working on that. Today I just wanted to focus on the resume simply because um, for a lot of the on-campus positions, that's what they're looking for. Um, they want that snapshot look at, at you and your qualifications and your skills and abilities. And they want to know quickly, they want to scan through it quickly, look at it, and determine whether or not you're somebody they want to call in possibly for an interview. So um, for the resume, off, also to our left here, we have um, our career guide, I have some with me today. You guys are welcome to take these hard copies. I just wanted you to know also it's online and it's available for you to just go to our website and click on it. And I brought these little flyers I, I passed out to a couple of you. And on there it has our website. If you haven't got one, please get one before you leave. And that's how you go to these all these great resources that we have on here. So let me see if I can get this to cooperate with me here. Let's see. All right. I'm a Mac user, so please excuse me for a moment <laughs> while I deal with this PC. I haven't always been a Mac user just recently, and so it's funny how my brain's already transferred over to, to using a Mac, and I have kind of a difficult time with a PC these days. Let me see if I can find it for you real quick. Just a sample. This resource, by the way, also has some things in here. Um, I'm, I'm passing it up right now, but it has a checklist of things that you should be doing, and even as graduate students. And so when you get the chance, go through it, look at it. It helps you think about, hey, have I done these things to get myself prepared for professional world? Let me find it. All right, here we go. We're coming up on the resume information. Okay, this particular one is called a chronological resume. And uh, there are different ones in there, but I wanted to just focus on this one. And um, what makes it chronological is how you put your job experiences on there. Uh, we're gonna start up at the top though, because that's where any employer is gonna start. They're gonna start at the top of, of your resume and work their way down. And so, and when you're putting your resume together, that's how you think about information. You think about what's the most important thing that they need to know about me. That goes up at the top, and then you prioritize things on the page. Most important up at the top and less important as you go down the page. And of course, what's very, very important for them to know are things like your name and how to contact you, your address, phone number, email address those kinds of things. Uh, you'd be surprised how many resumes I've looked at for students and they've left off really important things like that. They might have their name on there, but the employer's like, you know what, this person sounds great, but how do I call them? Because they left off their phone number. You know, it's kind of funny how that happens. Um, a couple of quick things that I like to point out, and I, I point this out to every grade level I talk to, is when you're putting on your, your phone number, 
um, you know, put on the one that they're going to be able to reach you at. So the phone number that you're going to be picking up, don't give them a number that you're never at and, and you rarely pick up. That doesn't help them or you very much at all. And then when, uh, when they do call and uh, leave you a message, one, another thing to be sure that you, you think about is your voicemail. Have you guys ever called somebody and it has one of those obnoxious voicemails? They're like, hello, hello, hello. Oh, I guess you figured it out. I'm not here by now. Something obnoxious like that, right? <laughs> or one that a lot of employers tell me, they're like, oh, this is so not cool. Whenever they call you and it goes right to a song, like some kind of rock song or whatever, they're kind of like, did I call the right number? You know. <laughs> so um, think about that. That voicemail represents you. And so when you start doing the job searching, even if it's for a, a, a position on campus or what have you, be sure that the voicemail that's on your phone represents you in a professional manner. When they call it, they're not like, I so don't want to call, call this person again. You know, <laughs> Be sure that it represents you well. And then the same thing with email address. Um, I've had all kinds of crazy email addresses that uh, you know I've seen on emails, on, on resumes, and things like "Hello Kitty" or uh, "HugsandKisses.com" or whatever. You know, um, be sure that that represents you in a light that you you would like it to. If it's something raunchy or just not professional sounding at all, they're going to look at that and go, "Wow, this person's not serious about my job." So, uh, a lot of times, what I tell students to do is. Maybe even think about um, having a separate email address for job searching so that whenever you're really searching for a job, all of those responses go to one email and they don't get mixed in with your other personal email so that whenever you're going and looking, hey, did I get a response back from this employer? It's going to this one email over here and it's not all mixed up. Does that make sense? So just a couple little things about contact information. It's very important that it be on there, but it also represents you, so be sure that you're putting something that represents you well. Um, as we go down, I'm just going to go quickly through here. Some things that are on here are definitely your education. That's what you guys are here. That's what you're working on. Be sure it's the most up-to-date, most current educational pursuit that goes first. They want to know what degree you're currently working on. And they also, they don't necessarily care how long you've been working on it. What they want to know is when are you going to be finished with it. So they're wanting to know your expected date of graduation. And they want to know your major. And if you have specific fields of study, that, that's pretty important information that goes on there as well. So be sure that you, you do yourself a good service and put your educational information on there. And then, yes? So even if you have not received a degree, it's okay to put your expected graduation? Yes. Okay. It's always your best guess until you graduate, but it gives them some idea of when you're going to be done with that degree. Okay. Yes. Yes, sir. Um, how far do you go back in terms of your education? Do you start at your first university attended, or do you go back to like high school? That's a good question. Uh, you guys are graduate students, so high school information no longer, no, no longer important. Um, what goes on there are any college degrees that you've earned. Not necessarily every school you've ever attended in college. That's not important. What's important are college degrees that you've earned and your most current educational pursuit. That's the kind of stuff that they're going to be looking at. That helps them determine your eligibility. Um, just a couple other quick things here. Skills and attributes. Those are skills that are important to the job you're applying for. Um, Adriana could probably tell you a little more about this, but whenever you look at a job posting or a job description, they tell you what kind of skills that they're looking for, and those are the kinds of skills that you're supposed to put on your resume. That's the kind of, those are the kinds of skills that are important to them. Um, you don't want to necessarily put every skill under the sun, uh, especially things that are not important. You've got a short uh, space uh, to put information on here so you put the most important thing. So think about those skills that are important to the job you're applying for. Uh, for employment, since this is a chronological one, you put your most recent, most current job first and then you work down to older jobs. And general rule of thumb for a resume is 
um, you put your um, work experiences that are going to fit on that on that one page. If it's a CV, that's pretty much everything under the sun that you've done work-wise. But for a resume, that's more succinct. So you're sticking to that one page, and you're going to just put the um, recent work experiences that go that apply. Um, and what they want to know there, uh, something to point out for you on this section. Is for employment, what you don't see on here is the name of your supervisor. You also don't see on here why you're no longer in that position. That, that, that kind of information doesn't go on a resume. It's probably going to go on your application. Most applications ask for that kind of stuff. But it doesn't go on a resume. So uh, be sure that you don't put things on your resume that they're not asking for and that they don't need on a resume. Make sense? Yes? OK, great. And then after your employment um, experiences, um, a lot of times you'll have opportunity to tell them about any honors or awards that you've received. It's great when you can give them honors and awards that apply once again to the field. If you're a biologist and you got these wonderful biology awards or honors, those would be the kinds of things you want to put on there. Um, if you have others' honors and awards, those would be great too, but you really want to focus on anything that shows how qualified you are for the field you're going into. So that's what you're really hitting there. And then for other activities, these are things like the club memberships, group, group or club affiliations, um, extracurricular activities like volunteering somewhere, those kinds of experiences. What you don't put on here and what they don't necessarily want to see are your hobbies. Well, that's great information. Doesn't really show them how you're qualified for the job, right? So hobbies, like I like to garden in my spare time. That has nothing to do with me being a career counselor, <laughs> so I wouldn't put it on there. Um, that kind of thing. So you stick to activities that are relevant to what you're going into. Um, almost out of time, but I just wanted to point this out to you. Um, and I'll be here for afterwards to, to talk to you about any other questions that come up. And just a couple of other things I wanted to, to mention on here um, is you never put anything on your resume that isn't true and doesn't truly reflect you as a student. But you also do a disservice to yourself if you don't put all of those things on there that show your qualifications. So uh, I like to point that out to students. Uh, in the past, it, it got to be kind of a problem that students were putting things on their resume. They're making them up, basically, putting things on there that weren't true. And then when that came to light, they were fired because they were um, dishonest. But at the same time, I get a lot of students who don't think about uh, skills, extracurricular activities, honors, and awards that may really make them stand out. So be sure that you think about those things. And um, once again, our services are open to you. We can help you look at your resume and your curriculum vita and those kind of good things. So please come and see us when you get the chance. OK? And now we'll have Kristen Gardner from uh, Grad Studies. Okay, so who knows what a graduate assistantship is? Does anyone know what that actually is? Because when I first heard the term, I didn't even know what it was. Does anyone know? Nobody? Okay, well basically, a graduate assistantship is an opportunity for a graduate student to work in something related to their chosen field while they're pursuing that program, and you get compensated some kind of stipend with it. There's three types of assistantships that we have here at TAMU CC. Um, the main one is a teaching assistant, a graduate assistant that teaches. And sometimes you'll just be assisting an instructor, and other times you'll be the sole instructor for a course. 
and do other such related duties that go along with that, grading, uh, administering exams, lectures, labs, things like that. We also have assistants, graduate assistants that do research. Sometimes you um, are able to have the opportunity to work directly with a faculty member to do research that's supporting a grant or that's coming from other um, sources, but other times you're doing other duties that contribute to research, but maybe it's not quite the same as if you're not a science person, you may not be you know, in a lab mixing chemicals, but you're doing other things that contribute to progressing a department or things like that. And anything not involved with those two purposes is called a graduate assistant non-teaching. Okay, to be a graduate assistant, you have to meet a couple qualifications. Um, you need to be in a degree seeking program. So at this time, certificate seeking and non-degree seeking students um, don't have that opportunity to be a graduate assistant. Um, but if you are in a program and you're in good academic standing, which usually means 3.0 GPA, and you meet the enrollment requirements, then you have that opportunity. The enrollment requirements, there's two things I'm gonna tell you about. First is the university policy. This is what's in the graduate catalog. Um, all students who are graduate assistants um, need to take six hours in the long semester. And in the summer, if you're going to work during the summer, um, it's three hours. But just in the combined sessions, you don't need to take three summer one, three summer two, just one or the other. But it's important to note that some colleges and some departments require you to be um, enrolled full time, which is nine hours. So certain grants. Certain colleges like the College of s and and certain departments like our department, Graduate Studies and Research, have students um, work or take nine hours because that's how we get our funding. Oh, uh -huh. that was going to be my question. Why, oh. do we have to, why do we have to subscribe to nine hours? Because in those colleges, it, um, I believe like for the College of s and it's just a part of their overall goal as the college to have degree completion. So they want students to be, you know, steadily progressing towards that degree, and that that they feel will contribute to that. And other departments, like the department I work in, that's how we get our money to fund the graduate assistants. So if they're not taking enough hours, there's not enough returned back to pay people for the next year. Does that make sense? Okay. And basically, graduate assistants are appointed what's called half time. And that's um, 20 hours per week or 50% effort. Now, um, usually graduate assistants don't work hours beyond that because it's considered to be you know, full time because you're taking these hours in school and then you're doing all this work as a graduate assistant. So if you take more than that, if you work more than 20 hours, then that's considered like an overload, so to, so to speak. Um, so if there are rare situations where an exception is needed, that would be addressed to the graduate dean, which you can send to me, and I will send to him. And um, appointments are generally for um, anywhere from one semester up to one year. And then you can be reappointed after that, depending on you know, your eligibility, the funding that's available, and the need in the department. So generally, master students are compensated 1100 per month for that 20 hours a week. And doctoral students, a little bit different. It varies by the program. So you would just want to contact your program advisor about that. So this workshop's about how to find graduate assistantships. And my number one recommendation is to talk to your graduate program coordinator. This is how it is in most universities. It's sort of. Um, sort of directed by what you're studying and your program coordinator or your advisor should have a good idea of what kind of departments are hiring for that, what, um, if there's anything available in their department, and they can really direct you to know where to look. Um, I've been corresponding with a lot of advisors and people in the colleges, and the way they prefer to be contacted is by email. So I know it's, sometimes it seems like it would be more effective to go in person, but due to their schedules and due to the nature of their office environment, it's really better to contact them by email. That's what they prefer. Um, check the Career Services website. 
Um, I know the College of Nursing spe specifies that that's where they post if they're looking for someone. And department websites and email addresses. A lot of um, departments want you to check their website. And also, you can give them a call if you are still trying to look. So I have in your flyer, if you picked one up, if not, they're in the back. This list of departments that hire graduate assistants, or at least they hired a graduate assistant last year. So I can't speak for all of them at this moment, but as of August 31st, sometime in the past year, they hired someone. So um, you can see what type of assistantship they usually hire. If it's teaching or research, what you're interested in, you'll also want to take note if your particular program is listed there. Some programs, they just don't have funding given to them to hire students, which is really sad if you're in that program. But you know, there's other places you can look. Like if you take note, the library hires people to work there. And other departments, like Elite, Title V, um, and a few others hire a mix of different majors and types of students. So is anyone here in science, in the sciences, if your program is in the College of s &T? OK. If you want to be a teaching assistant, if you want to teach, this is the place to go. This website, which is on your flyer, is sci.tamucc.edu slash students slash grad funding. They told me that the only people they consider to be teaching assistants are people that fill out this application right there on their website. So if you want to be a teaching assistant, that's where you go. And is anyone here a non-resident from out of the state or country? OK, then this is for you. If you are a graduate assistant and you meet certain requirements, then you might be eligible to receive an in-state tuition waiver. What that does is it, it's a special law in the state of Texas that allows you to pay the in-state rate or to have an adjustment on your tuition. The requirements are basically that you're eligible to be a grad assistant, so you meet all those requirements we discussed earlier, GPA and enrollment and all that. Um, your employment date has to be on or before the 12th class day, and, which basically I think the purpose is just to make sure you're you know, working the whole you know, semester time. And that you're in the correct title code, which HR knows all about that. There's certain title codes they have to put you in your supervisor. And also that your assistantship relates to your degree. You're at 50% effort, and you turn the form in to me. This is the form. I think you've already seen this before, right? OK. Um, this is what the form looks like. And the first part is for you, the student, to fill out. And you just put your information as best that you can fill out. Now the second part is going along with that requirement that it relates to your degree. In this section, the dean of your college or the chair of your program would sign right there. So sometimes um, people get a little confused and think that means their supervisor who they work with. But it's the person in your college that's your closest to your program because they know what your program's about. And then after that, you will sign. And then you'll turn it into the grad office, which the date is on the form. So I'll open it up to questions. Usually, there's a lot of questions about graduate assistants. So what can I answer for you? Mm -hmm. um, OK, for instance, I'm a college of ed educational administration. Mm -hmm. I, there is that first year programs. Is, mm -hmm. is that just a general um, thing that uh, can anybody basically sign up for to be a first year? The first year programs is, I think, the teacher, the graduate students who teach the seminar and the first, the first year course, right? Um, I've seen, I believe, a variety of different majors in that. Okay. So it would be a good place to check out. You could generalize. Yeah, and you can inquire and see if they have something there. I have seen several different programs. So it's not, you know, like how it says it has to be related to your degree. So, I mean, it's teaching, so it would. Right. And 
and it's kind of a broad it's kind of a broad term related to your degree because a lot of things can be related to your degree. There's skills that everyone needs to know. Everyone needs to know how to, you know, how to speak, you know. Most most everyone will need to at some point or another, you know, be in a meeting or speak about, you know, present an idea to someone. Those are things you can learn, you know, uh, filling out certain kinds of paperwork, learning technology, computers, like those are things everybody needs to know. So they relate to pretty much everyone's degree, in my opinion. So, oh, and another thing I wanted to note that, um, so we all know the economy, you know, hasn't been the greatest. And sometimes it seems kind of hopeless if you're looking for a job and you're looking and you're looking and you can't find something. Um, don't give up hope if they, if a department tells you they don't have any openings, they're not lying to you. It's probably because they've got funding cut. Most departments have had, I know everybody on campus has had funding cut. So that, you know, doesn't just hurt you guys, you know, it hurts us too because students help departments so much. We love having students in our office and, you know, graduate assistants, they do great work for us. And so don't get discouraged, you know, just keep trying and just keep looking and, you know, eventually you'll be successful. And keep on working on your resume. If you notice that you're not getting called back, then it's probably a resume that you can work on. If you're getting interviewed and not hired, then that might be your interviewing skills you might want to work on, and career services can help you with both of those. So, yeah. Another question? Yes. Um, it was mentioned that it, half time is 20 hours a week. Uh huh. Right. Okay, if somebody has a full time job and they're taking six hours in the evenings, um, do weekends count for those 20 hours? Like, say, I know for teaching, that would probably be kind of hard. But like a research assistantship, is that depending on the department's hours or um, stipulate? It's 20 hours a week no matter how the department defines their week. So anywhere on campus, it's 20 hours. Is that what you're asking? Or? I think so. You might, I mean, depending on how, most of the departments are just open Monday through Friday. But if you work on a Saturday, then, you know, instead of working. Yeah, that counts towards your 20 hours. Any other questions? Oh, oh okay. Um, this is, for instance, my first semester, and so I'm, I, I'm probably safely assuming there might not be any assistantships available for this semester, but for next semester, that would be obviously the GPA that would be used this, mm -hmm. for this semester. Mm -hmm. But if I started this semester, would I be eligible because I just started? Um. What good academic standing means in this case is good academic standing at TAMU CC. So if you applied and maybe your GPA was a little on the low side, but right now you're still in good standing. After your grades come out and if you get you know, below a 3.0, then you're not in good academic standing anymore. So you kind of started a clean slate when you applied to a brand new program. So. And uh, next up is uh, Human Resources. Adriana Vela will come and kind of wrap things up from uh, the other end of it after you've been hired or what's required. Is that what we're going for? Can we give a quick overview about what we, what we do? What Sounds good to me. Here's Adriana. Thank you. Hi. Our orientation in human resources for our graduate students is uh, pretty much tailored for those GAs who are benefit eligible. We are informed by the departments whether you guys accepted a benefit eligible position. Um, some departments, like Kristen was mentioning, um, give certain percent efforts depending on how many hours you're taking. Um, there are uh, GA positions we call them all GAs, whether they're TAs or RAs or non-teaching, um, that are not benefit eligible. So when you come into campus and uh, you complete a hire packet and you're hired by a department, it comes to human resources. And uh, that new hire packet that you turn in gets submitted into the system as a non-benefit eligible until we receive information from the department telling us 
which ones of those uh, GAs were benefit eligible. From that point, we call you into our uh, orientation and let you know what your options are. Um, we give you a quick overview about uh, where your new hire packet is kept, um, what information you have access to, what information you need to look into. Um, if you do accept a position on campus and you are benefit eligible, there are uh, time constraints. So um, the main thing that you want to look at is what email address did you use for your new hire packet. It, that's the email address that gets put into the system and that's the email address that we're going to be sending you information to. So it's very important that you check that email address because if you submit an application and you are under the impression that you're benefit eligible um, and you don't become benefit eligible, we need to notify you about that. If you um, are benefit eligible, we automatically have a certain amount of time to put you into a, a system that emails you notices to let you know that you've been put into the system and that you have a certain amount of days to make benefit elections. Um, so with that, you need to know how am I going to make my elections. So you have to attend the orientation so that you understand what the differences are between the options that we have to offer. Um, so uh, I wanted to just, yes, go ahead. I'm sorry, if I don't ask, I'll forget. Um, do you, you mean by benefits, you mean like medical? Mm -hmm. Insurance, really? medical insurance, dental, vision, uh, optional coverages that you may want to elect. The only thing that would be free would be the medical. And the medical is only free after you are considered uh, benefit eligible and after you have, you've been uh, eligible for 90 days or longer. Okay, the other um, benefits, which would be the dental and the vision, you would have to pay for those on your own. Okay, um, another thing that I wanted to mention, just touching on what uh, Terry had mentioned earlier, um, your resume, your resume is very important. As a GA, we are not looking, we in HR, are not looking at your resumes. But once you go into uh, the workforce, um, those resumes reflect you, what you've done, it re reflect you know, your employment, your experience, your education. And if you're having difficulties finding a job now, I strongly recommend that you go visit the career services. Take advantage of what you have available to you as far as um, fixing your resume, you know, looking at it. If uh, you're having a hard time getting a job, definitely go to career services and have them look at your resume because there may be things on there that shouldn't be there or there may be things on there that maybe you should put on there that might help give you an edge. Uh, another thing is, of course, you want to look at those email addresses, those phone numbers, and uh, the information you put on, on there. You want to have one resume that you use to work off of all of the time and that resume is going to be the generic one and then you want to tailor different resumes to different positions as you're as you're applying for them but you always want to go back to that main one um, and keep keep that one updated um, what else interviewing I mean that's another big thing um, you definitely want to take advantage of the career services for uh, getting advice on what you may be doing uh, while you're interviewing I just went through 10 interviews um, for students, for students, and only two of those interviews went well. Into the first two questions of those, of those other interviews, I wanted to just say, thank you, have a nice day. But out of courtesy, I went through the whole, the whole interview process. And it's amazing that out of 10 interviews, only two of them were decent. So yes, definitely go to your career services and have mock interviews with them so that you're prepared for the interview so that you're uh, so that you make a good impression um, other than that I really there really isn't very much that I can give you in regards to benefits the only way that we have uh, an orientation with you is once we get information from the department that tells us that you're benefit eligible because um, if I tell you anything now it's going to be information overload and you may leave more confused so do you guys have any other questions no for those uh, assistantships that only last one semester, so 
that person would only get benefits for about a month? For a month, exactly. Mm -hmm. um, the, the good thing about that would be if you continue your employment, you may not know that you may go into the next month, or if you get a, a position that's benefit eligible also with another department and it's within the same fiscal year, then you'll continue your employment then. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, continue your benefits then. Um, if you do not keep uh, your benefits or your employment for over that one, that one semester, then you have the option to elect COBRA. It's a continuation of medical, but you'd be paying, it, paying for it on your own. Um, it's still a good plan. It's still something that you can carry on your own if uh, you or your parents want to pay. That um, benefit, that health um, insurance, would uh, only be costing you 184, and you know, COBRA through your parents' policy may be 400 dollars. You know, we can't say exactly what the prices are. Um, and right now, don't quote me on that price either because those <laughs> change the you know change uh, fiscal year every fiscal year. So those are that's a very affordable insurance. I just want to add on to the note about email. Make sure that you're checking your Islander email. And also, if you don't check it very often, have it forwarded to your personal email. Because a lot of information about job postings, listservs, departmental information is sent only to your Islander email. So make sure that you have it at least forwarded so that you can get that information. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And actually, let me see here. I don't have my glasses on. <laughs> Kristen, come on up. Uh, we would like to thank you, the Elite Program. We'd like to thank you for presenting with us. Well, thank you. Wow. Uh, didn't you get it, Jason? Oh, you're too slow, Jason. We'll take it afterwards. <laughs> Yes, and Terry. <laughs> We'd like to thank you for being a presenter in our thank you workshop. And Adriana, I happen to have one for you too. <laughs> thank you so much for being a presenter for, with our workshop. And with that, thank you all for coming. <laughs>